Hello, and welcome to Character Class Live, where today, today, I'm going to be taking a lot of time and talking about one of my favorite systems of all time, Wraith the Oblivion. It is one of my absolute fantastic and fun systems out there, all about you when you die. Uh, well, after you die, because it's all about life after death. You're a ghost. Uh, because all the other World of Darkness uh, systems out there have been uh, going on about vampires and werewolves and mages and changelings. And then they decided to get into ghost stories because ghost stories are some of the most uh, fun stories out there. And I thought I would do a little uh, live stream here today, spend some time going over uh, Wraith, the system the setting, the different factions, uh, wraiths themselves as characters, character creation, and the powers, as well as the shadow, and maybe even delving a little bit into storytelling, uh, Wraith the Oblivion 2. Uh, and I knew this would be a lot to do, and a lot to, to get in on, so I figured it would be best to do a live stream, uh, and kind of open the floor up as well to anyone that wants to uh, ask any questions um, we'll either here in the chat or over uh, over in Twitter or whatnot because I'll be poking my head around at the the wonderful Twitterverse uh, now and then just to make sure that everything is going uh, according to plan and whatnot so Welcome to the stream, uh, anyone who happens to be here. Um, if you want to, after this is done, if you're new to my channel, feel free to check out my other stuff. Uh, if you like what I'm doing, like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Leave comments and whatnot. But we're here to talk about Wraith. And I would like to uh, begin the discussion just by uh, reading a little blurb that's on the back of this book. This is what really brought me into the game and what really told me that Wraith itself was going to be something special. Because the background, the, 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 they usually have like a little blurb here that kind of gives an idea of what the game is like. And this particular blurb sets my mind ablaze with possibilities. It says, This isn't heaven, this isn't hell. This isn't anything you could have imagined. Death wasn't the end. Death wasn't the answer. Death was just the beginning. So what do you do? Do you listen to the voice inside your head telling you to just let go? Or do you still fight? Still love? Still feel a passion that won't let you rest? Oblivion's the easy way out. Life after death is hard. Choose. You have eternity to weigh the consequences. As a poetic and very kind of uh, narrative driven uh, blurb, uh, as just something that's like a bit of a story uh, to, uh, to do this with Wraith, uh, to, to give you a description, to kind of catch your imagination this does it quite well it is fantastic uh, now Wraith as I mentioned Wraith is all about you being uh, dead that is the beginning of everything your character dies and is uh, hits the afterlife in the uh, shadow the shadow lands as it's called um, now any of you that have played other World of Darkness games, but have not delved into Wraith. Uh, you may have heard of the um, the Umbra, which is out there, the particular uh, spirit world that exists. And the Umbra is uh, basically, as it says, it's the spirit world. It's where spirits dwell, and Wraiths are no exception to this. However, Wraiths exist in their own version of the spirit world called the Shadowlands, the Underworld. 
which doesn't exactly line up with the normal Umbra, the normal spirit world. Uh, it tends to be kind of slightly off-center in the other direction. I, I've seen the um, I've seen in one of the books, I think the werewolf book, or possibly the mage book, where they have a bit of a drawing, a diagram of how the different versions, the different realms all interact with each other. And they have the material world, the, um, the mortal plane. And then they have the spirit world, the umbra, being just off to one side, intersecting, almost like a Venn diagram, in a way. And they have this uh, set up so that the, the umbra, the penumbra, I believe it's called, is a mirror of the real world, but where things are different, things have more spiritual weight to them. The Shadowlands is extremely similar, except it's the other side of that coin, the other side of that reflection, where in the Umbra, the, uh, that reflection is to the spiritual weight, where uh, the, um, the natural like the forests and whatnot, tend to be more lush, more green. The cities tend to be more more mechanical, more uh, polluted and whatnot. This is how the Umbra is. The Shadowlands, because it is tainted by oblivion, and oblivion is a force of decay, uh, a force of destruction that is uh, passive. They make, they make mention of oblivion in this, and its relation to the worm, which, from the werewolf side of things, is the uh, great spirit of destruction. You've got the wild, the weaver, and the worm, the trinity, or the triad, I believe they call it. And the worm is the force of destruction, where oblivion, where, where the worm is a, a, an active force of corruption and destruction, oblivion is patient and passive. It doesn't go out and seek to tear down anything it just waits for it to fall naturally and then claims it and because oblivion is tainting the shadowlands because oblivion in a way acts as almost a gravity a force of gravity for the shadowlands uh, on the shadowlands side of the umbra uh, when you go there it's reflecting the real world but Everything in that real world, in the Shadowlands, looks uh, more decayed, uh, more corrupt. Buildings look older, more weather-beaten, more uh, falling down and whatnot. Uh, so that's pretty cool how that works. Now, now that I've rambled on about that a bit, I would like to talk about uh, wraiths in particular. Just to start things off, kind of delve into what they are as creatures in the world of darkness and uh, kind of talk a bit about the character creation and whatnot and some house rules that I like to do. First things first, uh, wraith characteristics. There are four particular characteristics that wraiths all have. And it goes a long way to explaining some things when it comes to ghost stories and whatnot. The first we have is Death Sight. And as it says in the book, existing on the far side of the grave, race, wraiths see the world through coffin-colored glasses. Buildings appear to be tumbling down, plants are withered and sear, cars look to be dented wrecks years before their time, and people close to death bury corpses' pallor. Wraiths can see how deeply things and people have been tainted with the touch of oblivion. While this may seem to be a drawback, it does allow wraiths to access an object's weakness or the general health of a living being. Opposite that is life sight, which is the exact opposite. They can see the death in things, they can also see the life. Uh, this ability takes the form of being able to read the auras of the living, or at least animate beings, swirling veils of color that surround all things. As auras change from moment to moment, according to mood and health, etc., etc., which basically means all wraiths have auspects up pretty much all the time. They can see these auras and whatnot. They can see um, 
entropy in things. There's also sharpened senses that they have. They all have extraordinary sensitivity, sensitivity to sensory input. Hearing whispers and reading fine print presents no problems to any wraith. Among other uses, this can be handy for reading license plate numbers, eavesdropping on secretive conversations, and detecting the first whiff of gasoline as an arsonist starts to employ his tools on a haunt. Now, there's a downside to this. Uh, bright lights, loud noises, um, excessive stimuli can be uncomfortable for a wraith, can even uh, dazzle them and incapacitate them, possibly even doing damage if it is potent enough. But this is kind of why uh, in a lot of ghost stories, ghosts only come out at night, because at night, to a wraith, it's, it's fine. They, they can see in the dark extremely easily, uh, just a little bit of light lets them uh, see whatever they want, but having those sharpened senses means daytime with a bright sun, uh, loud noises, lots of people out and about, tends to be uncomfortable for them, so they tend to hide away from it. Uh, they're not like vampires in where they'll be uh, burning up into ash in the sunlight, but it's, it's uncomfortable for them, so they don't tend to do it. There is also insubstantiability. Because uh, wraiths are uh, ghosts. They don't have a tangible form in the material world. They are insubstantial. Um, I'll deal with that a little bit later because there is a house rule I have which involves corpus, which is something I'll be talking about later uh, in greater detail. But corpus is basically a wraith's health levels. Uh, what they're made of. Uh, but insubstantiability is one of those things because they're ghosts. They can walk through walls and stuff like that. Uh, you can't hurt something, technically, uh, that is uh, already dead, as they say. Uh, wraiths also have a shadow. And the shadow is something that is touched on in, uh, I believe, uh, Jungian philosophy. Uh, from, uh, I think it's Carl Jung. He was a uh, psychiatrist um, many, 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 many years ago. And the shadow is one of these uh, characteristics because every wraith has one. Every, from the moment a person is, dies and goes to the underworld, uh, the shadow is there. And the shadow is a wraith's darker nature. Uh, whatever whatever horrible things they might like to think about themselves, uh, any negative thoughts that they may have thought about themselves in life, anything that they've ever been afraid of themselves for thinking, uh, all those dark, uh, almost evil thoughts that people tend to have on a daily basis. Um, for example... Have you ever been in a situation where somebody is pissing you off and you've thought to yourself, you know, why don't you go die in a fire or something along those lines? Uh, or you've thought horrible things that later on you realize you didn't mean, but you still thought them. Um, things that you've never, that you think and never act on. These sorts of things all coalesce. Uh, when a wraith, when a, a person dies and becomes a wraith, to become their shadow. And this is one of those things that is uh, quite interesting because there is an entire section in this lovely book on shadow creation, which has its own thing. And if you ever play a wraith game, it's, it's one of the most interesting uh, mechanics they have. Because you don't play your shadow, your character's shadow. You don't play it. The storyteller doesn't play your character's shadow. Another player at the table gets to play one of your characters. Gets to play your character's shadow, I should say. And you, as a player, get to play somebody else's character's shadow. And the shadow's soul purpose in existence 
is to destroy the wraith. To make the wraith succumb and give itself to oblivion. It wants to completely destroy the wraith. Now, there are... There are some uh, some gray areas in here, but that's generally speaking what the shadow does. It's it's designed to tear down everything that the wraith tries to build, to destroy everything that the wraith the wraith will try and create, because it that's what it wants. It wants to end itself and the wraith, and it kind of has its own uh, sentience its own personality and it can be it can be fun it can be annoying it can be deadly in the right hands it can be all of those things in the right hands but yeah it's it's one of those fun little mechanics because you don't get to play it somebody else does and it's also the reason why I have always said that Wraith the Oblivion, as a system in White Wolf, tends to be one of those systems that is uh, very much, very much in need of having a mature playing group. Because if you don't have a mature playing group that understands that this is a game that you're playing, uh, that doesn't take the actions of characters or the actions of the Shadow in this case as being part and parcel of the whole experience. Uh, it can be very easy for uh, bad and hurt feelings to come up, for people to get angry at one another because they did something with one character's shadow that negatively impacts that character and that player getting upset because, oh, this person did this intentionally. Yeah, that's why the shadow exists. It's simply there to cause trouble. Uh, it's one of those things. It's you need to you need to come into Wraith with a bit of a open mind in that regard, because if you don't, there's that big opportunity for trouble to brew. Um, hmm. I've got a stream health telling me that. People may be experiencing some problems. Let me know if you are. Uh, please, let me know if you are. If you aren't, uh, that's great. I hope you're not. I am recording this, however. At least I think I'm recording this. I better be. Uh, yeah, I am recording this, so at least that is working fine. So that once I'm done this, I will have it uh, uploaded to my channel normally. But where was I? Hold on. I need to get a bit of a drink. Mm. Talking is hard work. <laughs> All right. The shadow is one of those things. Uh, then there is... Let's go to... Let's talk about the setting a little bit. Just a little bit. <clears throat> Because the setting is one of those uh, things. Now, directly from the book, it says that the underworld um, consists of uh, the far shores, the tempest, and all things within it, Stygia, and the Shadowlands are collectively known as the underworld. Technically, the other so-called dark kingdoms, those afterlives populated by the dead of Asia, Africa, India, and other places, are also part of the underworld, but as they have little to do with the night-to-night -night existence of most Stygian wraiths, they tend to fall under the heading of out of sight, out of mind. When a Western ghost refers to the underworld, he generally doesn't mean the Chinese or Polynesian deadlands. Which, to be fair, is true. But all of those dark kingdoms are connected together. Stygia is known as the Dark Kingdom of Iron, I believe. I, If I recall correctly, the uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese, that area in the underworld is known as the Dark Kingdom of Jade. Then there is the Dark Kingdom of Ivory, which is Africa. 
and a few others as well that I can't remember the exact names of offhand. Uh, there is some other ones as well. Um, but the Underworld is one of those things. Now, Oblivion is, as I said, the passive and patient uh, aspect of destruction. It is a part, a part of the natural order of things. Waits for all things when they break down. Everything must die eventually in order to make way for new things to be born. When kept in check by the forces of creation, Oblivion is an essential part of the cycle of death and rebirth. Mindless and eternal, Oblivion has always waited to swallow those souls no longer fettered to the skin lands, but not ready for transcendence. That's one thing I'll be getting in, I'll be talking about a little bit later, uh, fetters. Uh, but the skin lands is the uh, wraith name for the living world. Because people are made of flesh there. Skinlands. Um, its presence mars the underworld and the Skinlands to an unprecedented degree because these days it would seem that oblivion rages unchecked. Its pull strengthens daily as its appetite for souls increases. Simply put, oblivion is growing and no one is sure why. And that is one of the the overarching themes in a lot of the world of darkness with uh, vampire and werewolf you have uh, the coming of uh, Gehenna and the apocalypse uh, weighing over the heads of them with mage it's the uh, battle for ascension uh, that is overarching with changeling it's all about winter coming uh, no not that winter from Game of Thrones it's a bit of a different winter but it's they're, they're concerned with uh, winter as banality, where the world seems to be getting more and more banal, and nobody's uh, dreams and glamour are dying from the world. So eventually, it's going to reach a point where changelings believe that there will be nothing to sustain them, and they will all die out. Hence, winter. With Wraith, it's all about the fact that Oblivion is growing stronger. Nobody knows why. And there seems to be more uh, maelstroms coming up from it. Um, and more specters. More things just trying to pull everything down. Now, one thing about Wraith that can be a bit dark, uh, for sure. Can definitely be a little bit dark. A little bit, uh, a little bit creepy. Is the fact that... There are only a few specific uh, types of things in the underworld. There are basically the shadowy reflections of everything from the living world, uh, which can be seen through the shroud and still have problems because um, one of the things that is mentioned with Corpus is that a barrier in the real world, in the Skinlands, is still a barrier in the Shadowlands, but not completely because wraiths can go incorporeal and pass through things. But until they do that, a, a locked door will still keep out a wraith. But these things are all things that exist on the other, the other side of the Shroud which is kind of like the gauntlet and it is a barrier between the Shadowlands and the Skinlands. Now, the neat thing about uh, that whole mirror thing is that you've got buildings and whatnot, uh, landmarks are recognizable. So if you're doing a campaign uh, with Wraith and wish to set it in your city, you can use a city map. To lay everything out all those buildings are still there uh, they are still uh, solid to rates but there can be other buildings um, these these uh, almost in a way spectral buildings when, when I when I do Wraith uh, when I have storytelled it in the past I have gone on the opinion and uh, laid it out that 
anything that is existing purely in the uh, the real world, the living world, anything that is existing purely there is only existing there, um, but it has a spiritual weight, a spiritual substance on the other side of the shroud in the Shadowlands, but that uh, spiritual substance is filtered through the shroud. So anything that's just existing in the Skinlands, whether it's people or buildings or anything like that, can be seen, but it is hazy and indistinct. It's like looking through a thick gauze curtain at something. You can still touch through that curtain, and that curtain can still touch you through it. Or what's on the other side, I said, can still touch you through that curtain. But it's not, it doesn't look as real or feel as real to the Wraith. Now, that's one of the ways, one of the things that exist. Wraiths are another thing that exists. They are beings of plasm, is one of the uh, phrases that's termed like ectoplasm. That's what a corpus is made of, plasm. Uh, they are creatures of uh, not only spirit, but also mind as well. And a little bit of entropy maybe. But mostly spirit and mind. Uh, it's one of the house rules I've had with Mage the Ascension uh, and Wraith as well. This is that Wraiths, if you want to use magic, you can't just use spirit magic and hope to affect a Wraith because a Wraith is a little different from a normal spirit. So you need both spirit and mind because a Wraith is made up of their will, their consciousness, and their soul. So you need both. Now, other than that, there is a couple of other things that have existence in the Shadowlands. One of which is anything that is naturally growing there. Uh, they make mention in the book of uh, certain ore uh, harvested from the Venus Stair leading down into the Labyrinth, which is way on Stygia. Uh, there's probably other similar type places that has this ore that can be mined and smelted. Um, those, those are some of the things that, that naturally occur in the Shadowlands. And there's not a lot of stuff that naturally occurs there. So that's, those are like the rare things. The majority of objects that are kicking around in the Shadowlands are one of two possibilities. You either have a relic, which could also be an artifact, but both are backgrounds that can be taken. I'll explain those a little bit later once I get there. But it's either a relic or an artifact, both the same, uh, more or less, or it is made from soul forging or soul shaping. Now, those are different things. A relic is something that was destroyed in the uh, physical world, destroyed in the Skinlands, but has enough spiritual weight to it that it exists on the other side of the uh, on the other side of the shroud in the Shadowlands. It's basically the ghost of a thing. Now, the reason why that is uh, the reason why that is um, important is that you can have uh, ghostly weapons like swords and whatnot that are relics or knives, uh, those are all very possible. You can have a relic that is a gun, absolutely possible, because people put spiritual weight into their weaponry. They, they form spiritual bonds with them. Uh, there's a lot of psychic residue around them that causes them to exist after said item has been destroyed. However, having a gun that is a relic and is, you know, has that psychic weight so it exists in the Shadowlands. So you've got a relic gun. That's fantastic. Lots of people uh, put spiritual significance 
and weight into their guns, not so much into their bullets. And without relic bullets, a relic gun is pretty useless. <laughs> now, there are ways to make relic bullets. Um, there are absolutely ways that you can do this, but that takes time and effort and sacrifice as well. Um, artifacts are just relics that have been imbued with uh, powers. Uh, so kind of like wonders in a way uh, from mage and whatnot. But other than that, the only other thing is something that's been soul forged or soul shaped. And both of those are two different powers from two different of the guilds that are out there. Now, soul forging and soul shaping, the word soul is in the name. So they literally take a wraith, a soul. Uh, a majority of the time, it's wraiths that aren't tied to the skin land strongly, uh, so that if left alone, they would have fallen to oblivion and made it stronger. So instead of doing this, Stygia captures them, clamps them in chains so that they don't drift off to oblivion on their own, and then uses these wraiths as raw material to make objects, weapons, armor, tools, etc. Uh, even the money, which is called, uh, I believe, obol or obolai. I'll look at the, uh, the wonderful dictionary, because they have a lexicon in here. Uh, obolus. Yes, an obolus, the Stygian base unit of currency forged from one soul. So a single soul forged into a coin is an obolus. And those obolus can be uh, split up into pieces, although they tend to rejoin if they are brought back together again. Uh, but those are all made from souls. And they tend to not be entirely silent either. It's one of the uh, more horrific aspects of the underworld as a whole, where sometimes these souls don't even have much in the way of sentience, but other times they do because they've been convicted of a crime and sentenced to be forged into something useful. It's one of those... One of those little slight bits of horror that cause some fun. Um, what else is there? Uh, haunts are mentioned. The Shroud, that's one of the things. Let's talk about the Shroud a little bit. The barrier of disbelief and despair that separates the living lands from the underworld. The Shroud is what divides death from life. Spontaneously raised during the mysterious catastrophe called the Sundering, the shroud is what limits the ways in which wraiths can touch the skinlands. The stronger the shroud in a given place, the more difficult it is for the wraith to reach through to the skinlands there. Strongest in places of disbelief and reason, the shroud is nearly impenetrable in such places as laboratories and lecture halls. Conversely, in places where belief and fear of death are strong, the shroud correspondingly weakens, and wraiths have more play in the lands of the living. Cemeteries and homes with troubled Adolescents are often places where the shroud is particularly thin. Also, there are certain nights when worldwide the shroud weakens. These are the nights when the living would be well advised to stay indoors, for all over the world the ghosts are coming out to play. October 31st, All Hallows' Eve, is one of those nights. Uh, haunts are basically places where strong emotion has frayed the fabric of the shroud thin, here, the Shadowlands and Skinlands almost overlap. Here are the places that the living superstitiously call haunted, because that's where the wraiths have an easier time of accessing. Uh, Stygia is the eternal necropolis, a collection of all the dead dreams of empire mankind has ever wrought. As Carthage and Gomorrah fell, their ghostly ruins were gathered and brought to construct Stygia's courts and towers. When Rome and Byzantium were sacked, their wreckage was salvaged and brought to build Stygia even higher. Jerusalem and Paris, London and New York, 
Every imperial city that, was, that ever was is echoed in the architecture of a capital of the dead. But upon the seven hills of the Isle of Sorrows, Stygia the city and Stygia the empire have become synonymous. It is a great big old city uh, built on an ocean and there on that island is where the Venus stair goes down into the labyrinth which is a horrible place. Um, there is a sunless sea which is out there. I believe that's what they call it, a sunless sea. Where is it here? Boop, 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 boop. Maelstrom's in the River of Death. It's probably the Fire Shores. Uh, no. The Sea of Sorrows. Sorry. That's where the Fire Shores is. I mentioned those earlier, the Fire Shores. Uh, they are basically islands uh, way out across the Sea of Sorrows where it is said that every afterlife that anyone can ever hope for exists out there. But the ruler of Stygia, Charon, uh, the great ferryman, has uh, decreed that travel to the far shores is forbidden uh, and that belief in these afterlifes is also forbidden. So what are you going to do? Break the law just to go and hope to get an afterlife? Some people do. Some people do. Do do. But Stygia is there. Um, there are eight different seats of power for eight death lords that help to uh, serve uh, and rule Stygia in Charon's stead because he's been missing for a while. Uh, each one is in commanding of a legion. I'll talk about the legions in a bit. They're pretty cool. Uh, there's also the Tempest, which is to say it is basically... Let me just read a little bit here. To say only that the Tempest is the eternal storm of the Deadlands is to be guilty of gross understatement. Fair enough. Eternally raging with a fury unthinkable in the lands of the living, the Tempest is the raw fury that underlies all of the Shadowlands, separating them from Stygia and the Far Shores. Inhabited by shrieking specters and other fouler things, it is a roiling sea of chaos within which time, space, and distance cease to have meanings. The landscape of the ten Tempest is constantly changing. Rains of broken glass, noxious gases, eruptions of boiling pitch, and worse are common sights to travelers. Fragments of realities and memories are constantly inflicted upon those who journey through the endless storm, as each wraith who passes through the Tempest leaves something of himself behind. Even those souls who plummet directly to oblivion upon death leave a memory, a relic, or a feeling floating in the storm to be encountered by an unwary traveler at some later date. Yeah. There are places of stability within the Tempest, uh, one of which is Stygia itself, because Stygia exists within the Tempest on the Isle of Sorrows, this island of stability. Uh, at the very heart of the Tempest is the specter-haunted maze of the Labyrinth, which, according to legend, was gnawed from nothingness by Malfians at the dawn of time. At the very core of the Labyrinth, far worse than any Minotaur could be, is the mouth of the Void, Oblivion's embodiment. Few wraith have gazed upon it and returned to tell others of their impressions. Um, now... They mentioned the uh, the Venus stair going down, and that it is not quite a nihil. I think I'm pronouncing it or nihil maybe. Um, I've always called them nihils, but a, a nihil is a hole in reality that leads to the tempest, because reality itself in the Shadowlands is not exactly, even though it can look and feel almost like the real world, in a way. A, a tear, a nihil, can form uh, in an instant um, on the ground, on the wall, from the sky itself, and a maelstrom can spew out 
specters can come crawling out to attack you. Um, reality is not stable in the Shadowlands. It's one of those things. And it basically, Inihil is a rip in the skin of the Shadowlands to the Tempest beneath. Because the Tempest is everywhere, all the time. There's no getting away from it. It's only separated because the Shadowlands kind of exists as a layer over top of it. So pretty much every wraith is kind of definitely, definitely wanting to uh, to keep that in mind. Now, what else do we have here? Uh, metaphysics. That is something that uh, you need to be aware of when playing Wraith 2, is that uh, Wraiths are caught in a tightrope existence between life and oblivion, and their perspective reflects this. Just a shroud's thickness away from the lands of the living, they are nonetheless eternally separated from those they loved. On the other hand, each action, thought, and word is reaction against oblivion's steady pull, shouting defiance into the void. It is this balance between life and worse than death that the restless maintain for as long as they're able. So between the uh, the Shadowlands, Oblivion, and the Skinlands, uh, wraiths kind of uh, live out their days in there. Passions and fetters. Uh, basically, passions and fetters are what tie a wraith to the Skinlands. A passion is, of course, a strong emotion, something that they cling to, uh, some desire, some unfinished business. And a fetter is usually either a person, a place, or a thing that they have strong feelings towards that tie them to the skin lands. Uh, taking a person as a fetter can be extremely rewarding in terms of drama and story and whatnot, but it can also be dangerous because people, if a person is a fetter and that person dies, that fetter is then gone and you get hit with harrowing, which I'll get into later because harrowings are super fun. Then there's uh, relics and artifacts and soul forge goods, which I already talked, out, talked about a little bit. Standard operating equipment. There are certain items with which every Stygian Wraith is familiar. These are the basic tools of existence across the Shroud, and any Enfant who evades the Reapers will learn about them in short order. I'll read this a little bit here, because this is kind of cool. But first I need to drink. Oh, me, uh, me throat's getting parched. So how are you guys doing? Do you have any questions for me? Any uh, anything that you'd like to uh, like me to touch upon a little more that I've already talked about? Uh, let me know in the uh, in the chat. I'm going to check here in a second. Hmm. Gotta love some water. All right, let's see what we have over here. Nope, nobody in the chat. Uh, talking just yet Boop, don't think there's anybody over here boop boop do 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 crack that up let's see here doot doot okay nope all right then <clears throat> Well, we'll continue. Uh, let's see. Weapons. Uh, for reasons of economy, it is the classic weapons that work best. Relic guns require an investment of pathos, and relic ammunition is in short supply. So most wraiths fall back on swords, knives, and the like. It is simple to craft blades and armor from souls. Many wraiths, frankly, prefer the panache that comes with having a sword at their hip or a dagger in their boot. Ornate weapons are seen as status symbols. And relic or artifact blades are highly prized. Small wars between necropoli have been known to start over the disposition of legendary artifact weapons. 
uh, oboli, the base unit of Stygian currency, is the obolus. Forged from a single soul, an obolus is the only legal tender in Stygian territory. Most renegade and heretic bands use them as well, out of a lack of an acceptable alternative. Oboli theoretically can be chopped up for change, but bits of a single obolus that are separated tend to reform as soon as they can. Scattered bits of random change, on the other hand, never coalesce. Certain, more sensitive wraiths have given up on the notion of half oboli entirely as they ponder the effect of being quartered on smelted souls. Manacles and chains. The well-dressed reaper's tools of the trade. Chains and manacles are used in a variety of ways throughout the underworld. Their primary function, of course, is to bind and imprison wraiths. Many chains are empowered to prevent bound wraiths from using their arcanoi to escape. Others are used as fashion accessories by debonair domens. Few objects in the underworld are as thoroughly loathed as Stygian chains. All renegades, almost every heretic, and even a great many Stygian lemurs see them as reminders of the ever-hungry forges. And lastly, masks. Extremely fashionable among many wraiths, soul forge masks serve to depersonalize offices. Useful as a way to command allegiance to an office as opposed to an office holder, the masks of hierarchy officials are passed along to successive holders of posts. Even the death lords are known only by the masks and other badges of their office. It matters little which wraith wears them. So those are considered some as I say, standard operating equipment. Uh, but it also serves as symbolism as well, because you've got wraiths that tend to rely on bladed weapons, uh, where their money is made from the souls of people that have died, and where not only are masks used to hide the identity of those in charge, but where manacles and chains tend to be uh, common practice. Uh, lending a bit of an air of slavery uh, to things, which many, many wraiths seem to uh, latch upon that, and uh, especially the renegades. Now, factions. Um, renegades, as I just mentioned, are one faction. Uh, even though there are quite a number of different renegade gangs out there, it is the broad brush term to describe those who stand outside the hierarchy yet do not belong to an organized heretic cult. So most, most so-called renegades find the term insulting and prefer a variety of names ranging from outsiders to out of my way. Generally, renegades run in quote-unquote gangs, though these gangs can take the form of rampaging fray corps street gangs, or pacifist communes. There's no such thing as the average renegade. So they are, in a way, a lot like the Anarchs of the vampire world. Uh, they just don't like the Camarilla, is what the Anarchs do. The renegades don't like the hierarchy, and they're not a member of a heretic cult. That is the only thing that marks you as a renegade. So unless you toe the line for the hierarchy, uh, and you have no real desire to join a heretic cult, you're going to be a renegade, more than likely. The heretics, that term was first used by Charon after the discovery of the Far Shore's true state. Because according to Charon, uh, the Far Shores are nothing but a bunch of lies and traps. So that's why he forbid them. Um, however, as each cult sees itself on the true path to salvation, it simply assigns the name heretic to all of the other misguided cults with whom it shares the Deadlands. To the hierarchy and renegades, of course, it makes little difference what the heretics call themselves, and the term is used only slightly more frequently than those loonies. They are the ones that, a lot like the, um, the renegades being so disparate and disjointed and um, fractured when it comes to goals. The heretics 
each cult of the heretics believes its own uh, truth to what the path of salvation is. And those truths can be vastly and widely different. So there's no real, real way to, uh, <coughs> real way to uh, categorize them in one neat little box. Uh, they tend to spread out all over the place. Then you have the hierarchy, the monolithic organization, which is the oldest and longest lived of any in the Deadlands, founded by Charon as a means of unifying and ordering the chaotic afterlife. It has grown into a stratified, calcified bureaucracy, led by battling death lords and based on the enslavement of thousands of souls for use as thralls or raw materials. Criminalizing any opposition and crushing those who stand in their way, the armored legions of the hierarchy have rolled across the oceans to make sure that the Stygian law is maintained throughout the Deadlands. That's from the book. The hierarchy is basically what the name implies. It is a big, big brother bureaucracy type thing where if you don't go with them, you are against them and they will crush you into the ground. There are eight legions, as I mentioned, within the um, within the hierarchy. There are quite a few um, different ranks in the legions. I'm not going to go into those, but I would like to touch on the legions. You have the Silent Legion, ruled by the Quiet Lord from the Seat of Silence and consisting of the victims of despair. Now, the victims of despair tend to be um, they tend to be the sort uh, that are the suicides, I do believe. Um, and I should definitely make a note right now, uh, before I go any further, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, I apologize for that, but Wraith the Oblivion as a storytelling system because it's all about being life after death. Uh, there's going to be some dark topics covered. Uh, there's two books in this. Uh, I'll mention briefly uh, a little while later here. But there's two books at least that are from the Black Dog Game Factory. Meaning you need to be 18 years or older just to buy it. Uh, when they did come out. Uh, one of which is Dark Reflection Spectres. But the other one is um, the Showa. Charnel Houses of Europe, which is all about the Jewish um, Holocaust, uh, the Nazi concentration camps, uh, Auschwitz, and all of those horrors. And they, they, do, they do delve into some dark territory. As is mentioned, because one of those legions, as I just said, the victims of despair in the Silent Legion are pretty much those who have taken their own life in one manner or another. Uh, there is the Legion of Paupers, ruled by the Beggar Lord, from the Seat of Golden Tears and consisting of the victims of Mystery. Now Mystery uh, with the Beggar Lord are ones that aren't really explainable. Um, things that are just like out of the blue. Like, for example, getting killed from a toilet seat that fell off of the space station in orbit, comes down and kills you. That would be a possibly a uh, victim of mystery. At least I think so. I should probably actually look at it. I've got the Book of Legions right over here. At least I think I do. No, I don't. It's up on the thing. It's up on my shelf. But I do have it. Uh, it could also be Happenstance, which is the next one. The Emerald Legion, ruled by the Emerald Lord from the Seat of Thorns, consisting of the victims of Happenstance, which are, you know, one in a million chances, and so on and so forth. The Grim Legion, 
ruled by the Smiling Lord from the seat of burning waters and consisting of the victims of violence. So pretty much any soldier that's died in a war or victims of domestic abuse, um, murders of passion and whatnot, all fall under the victims of violence. The Iron Legion, ruled by the Ashen Lady from the Seat of Shadows and consisting of the victims of old age. So if you live to be a good long while and uh, pass away due to old age or natural causes, you tend to be inducted into the Iron Legion. The Penitent Legion, ruled by the Laughing Lady from the Seat of Succor and consisting of the victims of madness. Now, the victims of madness, what would you think that might be? Um, could be people who have died because of um, some crazy person that's gone out and killed them, possibly, uh, had died from their own madness. Um, all different ways. The, the Book of Legions goes into a lot more detail for each one of these eight. And if you're looking to do a hierarchy plot, it is one of the books I recommend you pick up. We have the Skeletal Legion, also called the Gaunt Legion, ruled by the Skeletal Lord from the Seat of Dust and consisting of the victims of pestilence, which is basically uh, toxins, uh, diseases, and so forth. All fall under the uh, Skeletal Legion. And lastly, the Legions of Fate, ruled by the Ladies of Fate from the Seat of Fate, and consisting of those whom fate has marked for its own. Now, they are one of the few that um, the ladies of fate and whatnot are uh, abstaining. And there is some hints uh, scattered around in Wraith suggesting that the original lady of fate, um, that she is actually Lilith from the Book of Nod, the one who teaches Cain, the first vampire, all of his, all of her secrets and whatnot. There's hints that that's who this is. So that could be some fun. They also make mention earlier here, I skipped over it. Uh, I think it was in here somewhere. No, no, I've, I've gone, I've gone too far. I've gone too far. There it is. Death marks. Centuries ago, the ferryman noticed a certain race arrived in the Shadowlands with strange markings on their corpora, visible through the use of the Arcanos fatalism. These marks were classified according to the patterns they made, and there seemed to be several varieties. Those who could see them suggested they were like birthmarks on the living, although their resemblance ended there. Some marks seemed to be carved into the very corpus of the after-affected wraiths, while some were raised like scars, others were merely changes in surface coloration like tattoos. Originally, there seemed to be a distinct correlation between the patterning and the type of person the wraith had been in life, and the ferryman saw this as the best indicator of how each wraith should seek transcendence. Time and circumstance, though, have conspired to change this dramatically. With the banishment of heretics and the denouncement of transcendence as a falsehood, the original purpose of the marks was ignored in favor of classifying wraiths according to the manner of their deaths. Now wraiths are branded with death marks as a means of marking them as property of a particular death lord. Some restless have taken this to extremes, moliating themselves in elaborate patterns to proclaim their loyalty to their masters and mistresses. Oh dear. So that's some fun stuff. Uh, Charon's Law. <laughs> You've got enthrallment, imprisonment, branding, and discorporation. There are the guilds as well as one of the factions. Um, where is it? Oh, uh, yeah, there it is. Okay. There are, uh, 13 guilds that exist. Now, Charon, because of stuff that happened before Charon disappeared, there was a great rebellion that was uh, 
raised up against Charon because of his this because of the the hierarchy and the Death Lords, and because the guilds were part of it, even though that rebellion failed, the guilds were then labeled as unlawful and banished. Now, the particular arcanoi uh, powers that each guild specialized in meant that those powers had become invaluable to the running of Stygia and the running of the hierarchy. So they couldn't just do away with the powers, but they made it illegal to be a part of the guild. And as each power tends to mark the wraith that uses it as being a user of this power, that also gives the hierarchy some idea as to what guild they might be a member of. Just knowing a power doesn't mean you're part of a guild. But if they ever find that you're part of a guild, you could be in big trouble. Those guilds are uh, the artificers, which are the soul forgers uh, that can uh, forge things out of uh, souls and make weapons and stuff. The chanteurs, the songsmiths of the dead, uh, the harbingers, guides through the tempest, the haunters, masters of pandemonium, they sow discord and weirdness. Those are the, the haunters are literally the ones that like haunt places. Uh, you know, cause the walls to bleed, uh, make people think weird things are going on. That's what the haunters do. Maskers, warriors, spies, and entertainers. They are the ones that have the ability to moliate or twist corpus. They are basically like the Tzmitzi, but instead of uh, sculpting flesh, they sculpt plasm. The monitors, specializing in the life web arcanos, they work with fetters. A, a monitor can find any fetter that you have, and they tend to be rather secretive about the higher levels of their uh, powers. The oracles are those who read fate's web. They're the ones that use fatalism to read death marks as well as fate itself. The pardoners, those who confront the shadows, they have the power, uh, the arcanoes of castigate. Uh, those, the pardoners in particular, those with castigate uh, abilities, they are the ones that are extremely invaluable. The artificers with their skills and the uh, partners are two of the most potent um, and necessary skills w to the hierarchy. The proctors, blatantly violating the dictum mortom, the proctors specialize in embody. They are the ones that can manifest themselves in the living world and become visible to mortals. The puppeteers are possessors of the living. They can possess things, of course, people. Uh, the Sandmen, weavers of dreams and nightmares. The Sandmen know the secrets of phantasm. The Sandmen are quite fun uh, because they have connections to changelings, being dream-based. The Spooks, telekinetically meddling with the Skinlands. Uh, any, if you remember the movie Ghost, where uh, Patrick Swayze is trying to move the bottle cap and whatnot with his mind. Um, that's basically what spooks do. And then us usurers uh, feared for their abilities to siphon pathos and corpus. Usurers and their ability of usury are kind of like the healers because they can gift you with pathos and they can gift you with corpus and they can take those away as well. There are also the ferrymen. And Charon was one of them. But the ferrymen are an extremely secretive, extremely mysterious uh, organization that kind of does their own thing. Uh, no, none of the Death Lords, and there are like eight powerful Death Lords, but none of them can tell one of the ferrymen what to do. Not even one of them. They are just amazingly uh, potent and powerful. Uh, 
and they have their own goals. They created, the ferryman created the Midnight Express. I have a book on it. Uh, the Midnight Express is a ghost locomotive. Uh, so it's a relic locomotive that is pulling relic cars behind it. And it stops at midnight, naturally, in every major city, including Stygia, at the same time, every night. It is literally breaking any laws of physics to do this. And yet somehow it does it, and nobody knows how the ferryman made it able to do that. Quite interesting. So then they give a history of Stygia and whatnot, and all the good times and everything that's that's going on, the different great maelstroms, the uh, Second World War that ended up happening, right up to modern times. That is where there are fun times. Now, they list uh, some other good things, and I would definitely recommend anyone who wants to play Wraith to read that history. It gives you a good basis of truth for how things are. Now, character creation uh, I'd like to talk about. Uh, Wraiths in particular, because it asks some interesting questions. Oh, pardon me. It has some interesting questions when it comes to uh, creating your character and your concept. Uh, one of whom is to... Where is it here? Yes. One of it is, who were you? What did you do when you were alive? How did you live your life from day to day? It's usually best to play characters who are relatively normal. Rock stars or actors can create problems. But in the end, it comes down to what you want and what your storyteller will permit. I will suggest you go with more normal characters. Uh, if it's your first time playing Wraith, for sure. Uh, but it asks who you were when you were alive. It gives you some suggestions uh, of character types like artist, cop, crook, dabbler, uh, drifter, politician, slacker, true believer, workaholic, these sorts of things. Then it asks you... How did you die? The way in which you died determines a lot about your perspective across the shroud. After all, a wraith who slipped away peacefully and one who has his own murder to avenge are likely to have very different viewpoints on dealing with the living. They give you a few possibilities. Accident, illness, mystery. You don't know what happened to you. You have a seeking suspicion you're better off that way. Old age, overdose, something strange, suicide, violence. Of course, the eight different uh, legions. Uh, why are you still here? Your regret sums up why you became a wraith instead of quietly moving on to the next level of existence. What is it you never said or did that, remain, that means so much to you now that you moved on? It says, failure. You died knowing you failed at something you set your hand to. Maybe a lack of confidence, perhaps a lack of talent, but you weren't good enough then. Guilt. Your sins were too great. They won't let you rest. Legacy. You wanted to leave something behind you, and now you feel obligated to protect it from the other side. Love. Maybe you never told the one you loved how you felt, and you need to rectify this from beyond the grave. Mischances. All the trips you postponed, the lovers you never took, the opportunities you passed up. You want a second chance at them. Uh, mission possible. You had a mission in life. Maybe an environmental crusade or a mandate to take back your government. But you're not going to let a little thing like death stop you now. Revenge. Unfinished business. Unfulfilled destiny. <clears throat> These are three questions that I find fantastic for really getting you in the head of your character. Uh, thinking about those and answering them makes it fantastic. Uh, it gives you a great, great idea to really wrap that character around you. You got your nature and demeanor as well, which have been in other systems. <clears throat> Choosing your attributes, it's the usual, physical, social, and mental. You've got uh, 753 that you spend. Um, 
choosing your abilities, talent, skills, and knowledges. You've got 13, 9, and 5, as usual. Uh, then you've got the advantages. The Arkanoi are the Wraithly powers, the special abilities. I'll deal with those in a minute. Backgrounds, which are, like, some of them can be resources. I'll deal with those in a minute as well. Uh, passions and Fetters. Now, for the Passions and Fetters, you get 10 points to spend. So you can make two 5-point Passions and two 5-point Fetters. But that means you only got two Fetters holding you to the Skinlands. Uh, to the Shadowlands, I should say. Or connecting you to the Skinlands. And if both those Fetters get destroyed, while well, they are powerful Fetters for you, if both those are destroyed, you have nothing holding you to the Skinlands anymore. Which means you're stuck in the Tempest forever. Because that's what happens when you lose all your fetters. Straight to the Tempest to try and eco an existence there. Which is why people tend to be protective of their fetters. <clears throat> uh, but you get 10 points in both of those. You get 5 points to start in Pathos. There's a background called Memoriam. I'll get into it in a minute. And however many dots you have in your background of Memoriam adds to your starting Pathos. You get your willpower. It starts at 5, can be increased with freebies, but it can never exceed 10. And then you've got your 15 freebie points that you can spend, and you can take uh, flaws to gain some, spend your freebies on merits, and do that fun stuff. Now, let's see here. Where is the wonderful wonderful uh where is it backgrounds that's what i wanted to look at first now you've got allies and contacts you've got resources i believe or do you have resources in here no you don't that's right <coughs> uh, allies contacts and mentor tend to be the uh, normal ones now there are some other ones. You've got artifacts, which are commonly fueled by pathos. Artifacts have certain powers or functions, and they've got uh, one through four, or one through five, for artifacts. Um, a level four is a gun that doesn't need relic bullets. is a major and unique artifact, which the hierarchy would dearly love to possess. So if you've got like a level four artifact. Other wraiths are going to want it because it's powerful. Uh, Eidolon is a measure of spiritual fortitude. It's an indication of special potential in a particular wraith to resist the temptations, assaults, and insults of the shadow. While it does not necessarily suggest that a wraith is objectively good or even moral, it does reveal a wholesome metaphysical resistance to the manipulation of the shadow. Eidolon is tied to a wraith psyche. Some Eidolons are so strong to manifest occasionally as a separate entity, much like the Shadow does. Uh, each point of Eidolon represents one extra die per session that a player can add to any role which resists some intent, plan, or ploy of her shadows, including the Shadow's Thorns. A player may use one or some of all of his Eidolon die, in any role, but not more than his total Eidolon rating each session. Eidolon can also be used during a harrowing to exercise some control over the course of events. There's Haunt, is another background, which is basically a place that you have that is considered safe to you, and where the um, where the shroud is lower within it. Legacy is fun because according to this uh, the legacy is something that you have left behind in the Skinlands. You have a legacy there. Uh, it could be for example a painting of yours hangs somewhere on a wall of an obscure gallery for a level 1 legacy. A level uh, 3 legacy you receded a devastated forest area through which people pass every day that is a legacy. You design the Eiffel Tower or the Statue of Liberty for four points. Uh, an important idea in modern life is attributed to you. 
Perhaps you founded a religion or a political movement. That's five points. So the more uh, potent and well-known your legacy is, the higher that background rating will be. And it lets you, um, let's see, once per story, a wraith can try and gain focus and comfort from her legacy. To do so, the wraith must travel to the site of the legacy or some important place associated with it, in the case of intangible legacies, and roll a number of dice equal to the level of the background, difficulty 7, the number of successes, represents the number of levels of damage the wraith can heal. Normal damage is regenerated instantly. Aggravated takes approximately one hour of attendance. So legacy gives you some healing opportunities. Memoriam is the essence of the dead. It is how many people remember you. The lower the dot rating, the lower the number of people that remembers you. Notoriety is kind of like memoriam, only it's fear because this is the one that will uh, fear you because you have notoriety uh, in the living world. <clears throat> uh, relics, of course, as I mentioned, are things that have psychic durability in the Shadowlands. Um, a huge or invaluable relic, a sophisticated device or famous object is five points. Uh, a major relic with moving parts, often powered by pathos, is four. So if you wanted a gun, you would need at least four dots in relic to get a gun. Um, and then there's status, what kind of status you have with the renegades, the hierarchy, the guilds, etc. are all in there. Now, the... The neat thing about some of these uh, wonderful backgrounds, especially Relic, uh, I actually have a house rule on Relic. It's one that I did up. Because it says here for uh, Relic, it says characters who take this background can purchase it more than once with each purchase representing one Relic of the appropriate level. Now, I don't play that way when it comes to when I've done Story Told Wraith. I tend to do the house rule with Relic, that background in particular, that you can, let's say you have four dots in Relic, right? You put four dots in your Relic background. That means that you can have one level four Relic, one level three Relic, one level two Relic, and one level one Relic. So just to give you a few things to actually make use of. Because otherwise you're spending so much into the relic background. And I, I never liked that. Corpus. That is the one that is 10 uh, dots in it. Or more, if possible. Because uh, there are there is a merit that I, can, I believe it's 1 through 4 dots in it. And however many points you spend on that merit, you get an extra dot for each point you spend on your corpus. But it also makes you stand out more. <clears throat> now, a wraith's corpus is one of those fun things because it is not only the uh, subconscious image of yourself, it's not only uh, their body, their physical manifestation, it's also their health levels. Because a wraith sheet doesn't have health levels. A wraith sheet just has corpus. Uh, every level of damage you take takes off a dot of corpus. And if your temporary corpus ever goes all the way down to zero, <coughs> um, you end up getting dragged down into the Tempest into a harrowing. And a harrowing is one of those things that I will cover a little bit later. What else do we got? <coughs> Let's get a little bit of a drink here. Oh, me poor throat. She's, uh, she's locking up here. I can feel it. Alrighty. Let's see. Any questions? Nope, no questions. And I don't think anybody's watching right now either. That's alright. I'm here to do it, 
So I'm having fun. We're already an hour and 20 minutes in. That's a lot. That is quite a lot. I don't think I've got anyone kicking around here. <coughs> nope. Nothing there. All right. So let's get back to it. Let's talk about the powers. Now, there are 13 different powers. Arcanois. Or Arcanos. Arcanoi. It's one of those weird words. There are 13 of them. Now, one of the things it mentions uh, in this particular thing for buying. Um, where is it here? Boop, 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 boop. I think it's farther back here. I may have missed it. But it mentions that each uh, Arcanoi, Arcanos, has uh, basic abilities to it. They can just minor little abilities. Uh, the way I like to rule it um, is that if a person, or if a character um, starts the game, like if they start with dots in a thing, if they spend their creation dots, because you get, I think, five dots to spend on um, your Arcanos. So they spend uh, dots on it. Just normal, straight up dots. Character creation dots. They get the basic abilities for free. As long as they buy one dot in it, uh, one level of it, they get the basic abilities for free. If they spend um, freebie points to buy dots in something, uh, they then... I think get it for free too. Let me check. Because it will be back this way. Won't it be? I do believe. Because this is the character creation. Uh, yeah. Freebie points. Okay. Yeah. They have Arkanoi, five points per dot. Arkanoi basic abilities, three points per Arkanos. So, yes, I had that backwards. Um, if you spend character creation dots on it, you can get those base abilities for free. If you're spending freebie points on it, you need to buy it. You need to buy the base abilities separately. So, the best way for the way I do things, if you want to get um, more than, let's say you wanted to get five different Arcanos, or Arcanoi, and have the basic abilities for all of them, best way to do that is to put a single dot in each one of the five you want. You get the base abilities for free, then boost some of them up with freebie points, because it makes things easier um, the one of the first uh, powers you have here the Arkanoi is Argos it is the ability that basically lets you um, travel in the tempest and fly uh, the second ability is a wraith using this art may fly in both the tempest and shadowlands flight is not terribly fast but can be a convenient way of getting around. Wraiths may hover using this art, but can never accelerate more than a jogging speed. Um, the basic ability is uh, Orienteering, which lets you actually determine a location, your location in the Tempest, and find a route to where you're going, as well as peeking into the Tempest from the Shadowlands just to make sure you're not going to jump in and there's, oh, suddenly specters there that's going to eat your face. Um, but there's a few other abilities as well. Most of it tends to be revolving around uh, getting around, travel in the Tempest and whatnot. In Shroud is the first level. It basically, you hide yourself from unfriendly eyes. Uh, flicker 
harness the natural distortions of the Tempest to quickly travel from one place or another. Basically, teleport line of sight. Jump. You can rapidly travel to any of your fetters, riding secret pathways, and oubliette, terrifying ability to cast other wraiths directly into the Tempest. Castigate is the partner's ability. And Castigate has uh, the uh, soul sight. You can examine the soul of another wraith as a base ability. And Bulwark, you can briefly guard yourself and others from a maelstrom. Castigate is all about getting in there and doing battle with another wraith shadow. You literally dig in there and pull the shadow strength out of it. it it's a fighting uh, ability in, in that regard. And it's one that the hierarchy as a whole finds extremely necessary. Uh, there's different abilities and whatnot. I'm not going to go into too much detail there. Embody by the Proctors uh, has the ghostly touch, a tiny whisper of touch to the material world. Just, just a little, a little touch. About the most you can do is gently write on a fogged window. You can move nothing larger than dust. And then there's maintain the material form. It's not so much an ability in itself as a capacity to maintain an embodied form for a longer duration which is handy. <clears throat> uh, Embody lets you whisper across the shroud, uh, manifest as a hazy translucent figure, or a solid immobile figure, or moving around as if you were actually alive, or even almost assuming human form for a short period of time. Uh, those are the Embody ones. Fatalism is the oracles are the ones who uh, who use it, and fatalism lets you uh, gauge a person, situation, or things importance in the grand weave. Is a base ability, and all of that deals with fate and the perception and manipulation of fate itself. Uh, it can be it can be pretty uh, pretty handy. Inhabit is the Artificer's ability, which lets them um, inhabit items and uh, basically distort electronic devices, um, travel quickly from one place to another through power lines, possess and control machinery. Uh, you can, uh, in, in various things, and... Empower is the highest ability. Create a form of inexpensive artifact by placing one of their Arcanos arts into a relic, which can be cool. There's also a way I know from the Artificers book where Artificers can inhabit, um, basically claim, or I think it's claim, yeah, you basically shell ride it, as they call it. You claim an object, and then that object is destroyed and becomes a relic because you were in it at the time of its destruction. <clears throat> so that is one way to possibly make Wraith bullets. Uh, but it's not perfect. And as I said, you've got to be in the bullet when it gets uh, destroyed. So could cause some pain for you. And not many people are willing to do that. <clears throat> Keening is the Shanter's ability, which is the Arcanos of Emotion transmitted by sound. Uh, basically, the uh, ancient legends of banshees and ghostly mourners. You have Perfect Pitch and Sato Voce are basic abilities. Sato Voce, you hide your keening arts in normal singing or casual conversation. And Perfect Pitch allows you to notice when another race is actively using keening <laughs> and then they've got different levels that lets you uh, lets you transmit emotion manipulate others emotions through music which is kind of cool life web is the monitors ability they are the ones that 
check up on fetters uh, can not only find them, can create an attachment, making a temporary fetter for someone, sever an attachment, making uh, <coughs> making a wraith no longer be connected to a fetter, or can even claim a willing mortal soul as their own through the highest level. Part of a contract where the mortal promises her soul in exchange for help from the other side. Thereafter, while the mortal lives, she becomes a fetter of the wraith. When the mortal dies, the wraith becomes instantly aware. If the mortal becomes a wraith, she and the monitor continue their link. It is pretty deadly uh, stuff when it comes to the monitors. Moliate is the masker's ability, which is, as I said, um, the manipulation and sculpting of plasm, which is where it comes from. Um, they can do quite a lot of stuff. They can make their face look like another. They can create weapons out of their own corpus. Uh, just all kinds of nasty stuff. They can literally take somebody and sculpt them into a lawn chair if they wanted to. <clears throat> Outrage is the spooks uh, ability, which is the telekinetic, uh, telekinetic combat typey ability through the shroud. Uh, any anytime like poltergeist activity, spooks are the ones that are attributed to it. There's quite a few of that. <clears throat> Pandemonium is the haunter's ability, which um, lets them pull on chaos itself and manipulate uh, reality, cause walls to bleed, uh, make uh, objects sing and dance that shouldn't be, distort time itself. All kinds of nasty stuff. The Sandman have Phantasm, which lets them uh, slip into a mortal's dreams, harvest uh, certain things, uh, glamour, I guess you could say, or they call it sand, I think, <clears throat> but it's the same thing. Uh, lets them manipulate dreams. They can even take uh, souls out of a sleeping person into the shadow. Uh, Shadowlands on a bit of a dream trip. Puppetry, of course, is the puppeteer's one. They uh, basically skin ride people or animals and uh, have fun moving them to their own particular abilities. Uh, they can also destroy a person's soul and have that body as a vehicle to maneuver around, but that body's going to decay because there's no soul in it, there's no life when the wraith isn't around. And usury is the usurer's ability that allows for um, transfer of pathos and corpus between uh, the usurer and somebody else. Which is all pretty useful stuff. The shadow. Let's talk about the shadow a little bit more while, while I'm here. <clears throat> uh, the shadow is, of course, uh, Super nasty. An implacable, inescapable foe. Common to all the restless, but uniquely personal. Now, when you are creating a shadow, you pick an archetype for the shadow. Uh, they list several different archetypes here, and in the Shadow Player's Guide, there is a, uh, a handful more that are listed. But each one has its own uh, style. Uh, angst is a permanent angst score. Always starts less than or equal to the permanent willpower score. To determine a shadow's starting angst, roll a number of dice equivalent to the wraith's willpower against a difficulty 6. The number of successes indicates the number of permanent angst points the wraith starts out with. For purposes of this roll only, ones do not cancel out successes. So when you are creating a shadow for another player character, you roll their willpower score. So the stronger that they make their willpower, the stronger their shadow can be. And that can be fun times. Then you've got dark passions, because uh, like wraiths, um, shadows have passions too. Dark passions, indeed. 
And I think they get seven points. Uh, yep. Seven points to spend in Dark Passions, which may or may not be uh, just opposites of a Wraith's Passions, or could be twisted, uh, twisted Wraith Passions. You never know. Hmm. Okay, now before I get on to some other stuff, uh, I'm going to take a brief break, very, very briefly. So I will be right back. Let's mute my little microphone here. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that, but I needed to go. Uh, now, um, as I was saying, Dark Passions, uh, they can be uh, simple inversions of a Wraith's normal passions, but they don't have to be. Because <clears throat> uh, it says right here, not all dark passions are linked directly to passions. A dark passion is based around these emotion. Self-hatred, for example, could be dive into a nihil. Uh, while a rage-based dark passion could be cause random destruction. It all depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, there's also 10 freebie points that get spent on a shadow and a bunch of thorns, which are special powers that a shadow can use which can do things like uh, have a relic that only manifests during um, catharsis when the shadow is in control. Um, it could have dark allies, which is specters that they can call on for aid. Um, shadow traits, which are dots of abilities or attributes that only pop up during catharsis. or of corruption, which uh, defiles the Wraith's presentation of herself. Uh, Pact of Doom. Um, if a Wraith has this thorn, she and her shadow can negotiate a pact by means of which the shadow will teach her a predetermined number of levels of an Arcanos. In exchange, the shadow acquires permanent angst equivalent to the number of levels taught. Indeed, Trick of the Light by using this thorn, the subtle the shadow subtly alters the psychic's perception of a scene. When the thorn is invoked at the cost of a temporary angst, the shadow guide should inform the storyteller what exactly the wraith perceives. The storyteller then relays this to the player. Trick of the light is not limited to sight, but any of the other senses. Bad luck, tainted touch, uh, makes the wraith something of a typhoid Mary. With when afflicted with tainted touch, the wraith spreads oblivion with a brush of a finger. Uh, shadow play allows a wraith who has used up all of his actions during a turn to get another one, but at a cost. If the shadow offers, the wraith can take an additional action, but he loses a point of pathos and gains a point of angst. The wraith cannot ask for the additional action. The decision as to whether or not it's available is entirely up to the shadow guide. Then there's a shadow familiar, a shadow life, whereby when the wraith slumbers, the shadow takes control and goes out to do things. And Devil's Dare is the emotional equivalent of a game of chicken. To use this thorn, the shadow guide invests a number of temporary angst points. Marked off immediately, writes down something that she dares the psyche to do before the end of the session. The difficulty of the dare determines the cost. And if a player feels that the number is excessive, she can petition her storyteller to have it lowered. The dare itself consists of an action that the shadow is daring the psyche to take. It must be within the wraith's capabilities to perform. Uh, and an impossible dare simply loses the invested angst. If by the end of the session, the dared psyche has not managed to work the dare into her action, she loses a number of temporary will points equal to the number of angst points invested. <laughs> oh yeah. These are things, these are the thorns and whatnot that a shadow can do to a wraith. Can, can you imagine that? Where you guys, you're, you're sitting down to start a session and they use that devil's dare uh, almost immediately where they're like, well, we know that we're going to be going in and meeting with this person. So when we do, I want you to offend her offend her sensibility and whatnot 
and you know you have to stay on this character's good side, but you have to now offend that sensibility of this character, this NPC, or you're going to lose temporary willpower, willpower points, which means that the shadow might end up getting control of you and doing something nasty if you don't do it. Oh, so much, so much wonderful stuff that can be done on this. Uh, they give you all kinds of fun ways to shadow guide. The Shadow Player's Guide is a fantastic resource for playing the shadow. Uh, it it basically gives uh, gives advice for like uh, lying to your uh, other player, who you are playing the shadow of. Uh, offering uh, shadow dice uh, at any one time or, or basically making them get used to you always having this uh, dice uh, available and then taking it away so many wonderful uh, little things kicking around in there now what else should I be talking about here uh I didn't talk too much about uh, fetters and yeah let's talk a little bit about fetters before I come back to uh, harrowings because fetters need to be one of those things that are talked about and I gotta skip back quite a few pages oh so terrible so terrible Permanent corpus, temporary corpus. Nope, that's all here. Fetters. <clears throat> oh, here we are. Advantages. Which is one of the fetters. Now, when it comes to fetters and um, passions, uh, a passion generally has a point value from one to five and tends to be connected to an emotion uh, it doesn't always have to be a positive emotion just a strong emotion uh, it can be curiosity uh, it can be rage it can be love sadness sorrow grief um, lust envy wrath uh, pretty much any of the sins can work uh, as an emotion um, they give a few examples in here like uh, keep anyone from discovering my secret pride four points uh, keep my greatest rival from succeeding envy three points protect my favorite book love two points learn about mages curiosity one point um, as how these things all go in here and you can create passions that have connections to fetters um, such as if, you're, if you had a fetter of uh, a little girl who was your character's daughter, you could have her being a fetter, and you could have a passion of protect my daughter, uh, love three, for example, which fits in nicely and does the trick. Uh, passions can be... Um, Passions can be almost anything, really. Um, generally speaking, tends to be subject to storyteller approval, but for the most part, if you're thinking about it the right way, you should have no problem getting your passions out. One of the best ways to get a passion, uh, and this is why I am a big, big proponent of having uh, background stories for a character. That you wish to create because the more uh, depth you put into a background story the more you're going to have to work with when it comes to creating that character's uh, passions or fetters because you've got all this stuff to work with in the history uh, it's also why i really like that they included those questions at the beginning who were you when you were alive how did you die um, what's keeping you around and so on those questions are beautiful for helping to fill in your passions. Uh, fetters tend to be uh, either people, places, or things 
that have an important weight to your character that mean something to them. Uh, so choose very carefully for your uh, fetters. Uh, you want stuff that is going to be not only uh, not only important to your character, but something that they would want to uh, protect, what they would be associated with, like a park that they have gone to every day for their entire life, um, that they are constantly at, um, a beloved family member, a uh, piece of jewelry or a motorbike that was once theirs that they rebuilt, uh, something that they put a lot of themselves into. These are the sorts of things you want to think about for fetters. Um, for the people and the places and the things that keep you tied to the Skinlands. Now, we'll jump ahead and have a look at those harrowings that I mentioned. Because that is something that can happen a number of ways. Let's see here. Losing angst. Acquiring angst. Surviving the shadow. Nope. Harrowings. Here we are. A harrowing is a nightmare ride through the tempest, a passion play or psychodrama starring the wraith, directed by the wraith's shadow with a supporting cast of specters. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Uh, harrowings are designed to torture a wraith, wraith, empower her shadow, force her into making mistakes which may rip away her passions, fetters, or her very essence and send her screaming to oblivion. To some extent, the harrowing is like a game, a challenge to the wraith to choose the right course of action which will allow her to escape from the nightmare. Naturally, the shadow tries to either stack the cards so that the wraith chooses incorrectly, or to make all choices seem so ill that the wraith cannot decide among them and consequently does nothing. In either case, the shadow wins and takes as its prize some part of the wraith's passions or fetters. This weakens them brings the wraith closer to the nothingness of oblivion, or drags the wraith down into the void. If the wraith triumphs, she breaks free of the harrowing, retains her passions and fetters. Though she may be unscathed, she is usually not unchanged. When a wraith experiences something that threatens her to estrange her even further from the world of the living, such as losing fetters, passions, all of her corpus or willpower, her mind fights back against the loss. At the same time, another portion of her, her shadow, attempts to encourage the break. There is both a strong life urge and an equally strong death wish within each person, and wraiths are no different. Their need, they need their ties to the living to remain wraiths, otherwise they simply slip away into oblivion. So anytime the wraith loses all of their corpus, temp corpus, or temp willpower, um, when it gets all the way down, a harrowing will happen, or if they lose a passion or a fetter uh, for certain reasons, uh, such as somebody severing you from a fetter, that can uh, that can do the trick and send you getting dragged down into a harrowing, which is then directed by the shadow. So it's like a story within the story that you're being told. They call it like a psychodrama because it's literally like there will be specters and whatnot that are down there taking on the roles of people that you know, wearing the faces of your friends, whether from life or in the afterlife. Um, and you'll be put in these scenarios and have to make a decision, make a choice, because it is literally like a psychodrama. It's a forced enacting of a play where you have to make the right choice or you get horribly mutilated because of it in one fashion or another. And they can be deadly and difficult and trouble. Uh, one of the things that they mention, uh, especially in a harrowing, is that you don't need to... Um, roll anything. There's no roles made in a harrowing. It's all narrative driven story uh, where the player character is reacting 
to what's going on and what's happening around her. Um, they make mention in the Shadow Player's Guide that you can get the other players involved in a harrowing, have them play roles of the specters, uh, especially if it's their characters that is involved in this. Fun little things like that you can do, uh, which really makes for a great, uh, a great, a great narrative uh, experience. I guess is the best word. Uh, it's it's one of those things. There is literally so many good stuff that can happen in here. Now, when it comes to uh, storytelling. Because we're getting close to, I think, what time are we at here? Do, 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 do. Just have a little check, see. Nope, nobody said anything in the chat. But we're getting close to two hours here. So, I've talked quite a bit about, um, about, uh, the Wraith characters and the system, uh, the setting, the factions, the shadow, and the powers. But I haven't really talked a lot about storytelling. So I'm going to uh, bring this to an end by delving into storytelling uh, Wraith the Oblivion and some of the things that uh, you can do um, when you are uh, doing your storytelling. As I mentioned earlier, when you're making characters, especially if this is your first foray as a player or a storyteller into Wraith the Oblivion, uh, keep things small. Don't try and go super big. But when it comes to player characters, if you are players, don't try and make, uh, as I say, like famous actors, musicians, and, you know, people that are like, I'm going to be this, I'm going to make a character that is this badass special forces soldier. Don't do that. Don't do it. You'll be doing yourself a disservice. Pick a normal character. There is so much more potential in such a character for uh, drama, for uh, fun interaction. Because if you have, for example, pick the most normal type of character you can think of right now. Um, for me, off the top of my head, the most normal person is... A guy who has a 40 hour a week job who has a wife a couple of kids maybe a dog uh, just living a normal life uh, likes to go to baseball games on the weekends um, or hockey games for that matter if he happens to be Canadian <laughs> <coughs> and is just a normal person and this type of person this type of people that are out there um, can have so much more potential for uh, fun stories in Wraith the Oblivion because how did this person die? Let's say it was a car accident. Um, a drunk driver ended up T-boning him. He ended up dying on the way to the hospital. So he hits the Shadowlands. He had his whole life still ahead of him because we'll say he was like, what, 32 32 years old when this happened. He had his whole life ahead of him. He had a wife. He had a young child. He had a family that he was supporting. And now these things, these families, this his wife and his child, his dog, uh, his parents, if they are still alive, any other members of his family, these people may be in part or in whole his uh, passions. Uh, some of them may be his fetters. That he now has to protect but because the hierarchy forbids you from interfering in the land of the living as part of Charon's code uh, you're not supposed to cross the shroud and interfere with the land of the living um, he's a member of the hierarchy now and he wants to protect his family he has to protect his family but he's not allowed by that code so does he break that law and protect his family or does he adhere to it and has to watch helplessly as bad things happen to his family it's up to the player as to how they want to react to that this is why I say more normal characters offer a greater variety of fun drama and story that can be told with them uh, it's one of the reasons that I love 
for Hunter the Reckoning that they say, pick normal characters. Don't be badass superheroes. Be normal, because this is the fight about, or this is the story about normal people battling against the monsters. And the same with Wraith. It's a story about normal people. Suddenly, you're dead. How do you react to that? Um, another thing to keep in mind when it comes to uh, player characters and storytelling, if you're doing it, uh, <clears throat> if you're doing it where they're just hitting the Shadowlands, uh, where they are in their call, as they call it, there's a call, C A U L, that surrounds them when they first hit the Shadowlands. Their Reaper is the one that cuts them out of it and fully uh, births that births them into the underworld. Uh, these. This sort of thing, uh, it is mentioned that uh, rarely a wraith is able to tear themselves out of their own call, but it's not something that happens often. And I've seen over the years a lot of players like to have their character be like, I tear myself out of my call because I'm a badass. That's not really the case. Uh, you've just died and have hit the uh, Shadowlands, my friend, wrapped up in an, a call, which is like an amniotic sack almost, that is ready to birth you into the Shadowlands. You are weak as baby's bathwater at that point, for the most part. Most wraiths tend to be. Uh, they can't seem to tear themselves out of it, which is really kind of uh, the point of it all. Uh, so resist the temptation to do that. Resist that temptation to want to play a super badass. No, play somebody normal because it will feel so much more epic when that normal person eventually drags themselves up and is a badass uh, in these, the Shadowlands. Uh, it will feel so much more amazing when that happens. Um, I have some uh, other little house rules that I tend to do with um, Wraith the Oblivion, as I mentioned, one of which involving Corpus, uh, which I said I would talk about and I'm going to now. Uh, that particular one is with the rule of insubstantiability, that it mentions in the book that a Wraith, if they were to get hit by something that would cause a level of damage, uh, they go incorporeal. This might be something that is in the Skinlands, moving through the world and moves through like a car for example driving down the street drives through the place where a wraith is in the shadowlands uh, that would be enough to cause a level of damage to a character so it could make them go insubstantial um, and i'm fine with that with that sort of thing but it also says that a wraith has to basically take a level of damage to go incorporeal to pass through a wall. That I don't agree with. Um, basically, anything that would cause a level of damage normally for, like, getting hit by a car, shot with a bullet, if somebody happens to shoot through like that, uh, if someone were to, like, run into you head-on without your character realizing it, even though you're a wraith, this sort of stuff has that uh, potential to cause a level of health damage. But if a wraith is simply trying to walk through a wall, wanting to pass through it, I have ruled, house ruled in the past, that that does not cause a level of damage. The wraith still feels pain and still goes incorporeal from that, but it will not cause a health level of damage. Because it makes, that I find the house rule makes it easier for the wraith to uh, get around. Uh, if they're not having to constantly worry about, well, I've got to go through this many walls to get to where I need to go, so that's going to be this many levels of damage, and then I've got to heal it. It it bogs things down. So I, I kind of streamlined that and basically said, nope, you don't have to worry about that. You can pass through as many walls as you need. You're not going to lose health from it, but you'll still lose health if you happen to get hit by stuff. So you still be careful of that. It... It makes things a little easier, but still keeps that realism in things, I find. Um, 
I already told you about my relic uh, house rule. I've got some other house rules that I do as well, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, what else is there to talk about? I don't think there's too much more. The guild books, uh, there are six guild books out, and in those six guild books covers eight of the guilds, because two of the books covers two guilds at the same time. There's also another guild mentioned in the Ends of Empire book, which ends off Wraith the Oblivion. But there's still five guilds that haven't been uh, talked about a lot. I'm kind of hoping the Wraith 20 book uh, fixes that problem, but I can't be entirely sure that it will. Still, it's one of those things. Uh, hmm. There's, there's a lot of potential in Wraith the Oblivion to tell good stories, to tell deep, dramatic, personal stories that can affect people. But as I said, it needs a mature playing group. It needs a group that people are going to uh, know and realize that this is a game. And they're not going to get themselves super upset about things. Because if they do, it's... It, it will happen regardless, and it's not the sort of thing that we want to have happen, but it will eventually. So, I don't know. I don't know. It's one of those things. Um, but there's a lot of good potential in it, of having people fighting and striving to uh, do the things that they missed in life, to protect the things that they are no longer there to protect uh, the sacrifice between their life as it is now in the underworld and what their life used to be. There are so many good things. And that's just, pardon me, that's just with the uh, Wraith characters dealing with the Skinlands. To say nothing about them dealing with the Shadowlands, with the Hierarchy, the Renegades, the Heretics, the specters and all the other people that can be out there. It is a fantastic system and one of my favorites. I can't wait for Wraith 20 to come out. Um, I ended up actually having, I, I kickstarted that particular one because of course I did. Um, and I'm super looking forward to some of the stuff that they have planned uh, because like all the other things is going to be updating some and tweaking some things, streamlining some things. I am looking forward to it. So, I think I think we're probably going to call this to a close. Um, sadly, I did not get any questions uh, coming in, so I can't answer any questions because I would have liked to. Um, I definitely would have. It would have been uh, good times, but I understand sometimes people aren't around. Uh, today was just the day that I decided to try and do this, finally. Uh, so, I hope I've helped some of you with my little, uh, my little discourse here on Wraith the Oblivion and all the fun. It's been a good two hours of me yammering on about this stuff. And, yeah, I really think that Wraith is a fun little system. I may try in the future because somebody has been in contact with me about doing a Wraith game. And it's the sort of thing that I have been wanting to do for a while. So something may be coming in the future. Uh, I've said that about a few things too. And those things still haven't materialized, but they're still on my mind. Um, it's just a matter of finding the time. If I could win the lottery, and not have to work again, I'd have a lot of time to devote to doing some fun stuff here. But that is probably never going to happen. So I'm going to leave this episode of Character Class, this live episode. Um, I hope you all uh, have enjoyed it. Those who have come in to watch, I have been keeping a clo super close eye on the uh, stream stats. So I don't know how many people have been popping in, how many people have been enjoying this. Um, but nobody said anything uh, if they have, which is fine. You don't have to. Um, still, for those of you who have, 
thank you for watching. For those of you who are watching this later on my YouTube channel, because I will be giving this a little bit of an edit and popping it up, uh, thank you for uh, sticking around and watching as well. Uh, until next time, as always, uh, if you like what I'm doing, please give that like button a tap. Give that subscribe button a tap as well if you haven't already, so you can be kept apprised of when I do new videos. And throw a comment in the comment section. Uh, let me know what you think about Wraith the Oblivion. Let me know of any questions you have that I may have uh, sparked in your mind. Throw them in the comments. I will answer them as best I can. Because, uh, yeah, I, I like Wraith quite a bit. <clears throat> I almost thought about uh, doing getting into something here on this because I have actually came up with a few merits and flaws uh, guild related merits and flaws for a couple of the guilds that don't have guild books because I was like that's bullshit why don't they and I wanted to to have some so I decided to create some and I thought about getting into it here but I think I will say that for another day um, because I think some of you might be interested in some of my my own created uh, merits and flaws for Rape the Oblivion. So that's going to be it. Thank you all so much for watching. As I said before, uh, you all take care. Uh, keep rolling your dice, playing some games, and I will see you all next time.